Oh, okay. I was waiting on you to tell me. So it's twelve thirty. All right. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to sit back and relax and enjoy this process. Either that or get up, walk around. One of the two. So uh, we'll do do this as we go along. My name is Glenn McNeil. Uh, I'm a yeah, what am I? I'm a registered dietitian, primarily instructor in health and human performance. Um, and the talk today is on if I can get it to work here. You know, it always works great when you remember your equipment. These little things are wonderful. But when you walk off and leave the dongle in the classroom and you're not sure which classroom you left it in, they don't work until you find it. Okay? So bear with me as I try my little portable mouse here. I'm going to talk about food safety. Right, and primarily its effect on you. Does it, I guess the question is, does food safety affect you? Why? Because you eat it. You eat food, <laughs> yeah. You eat food or you choose not to eat food because of something you've read or something you've heard, okay? And that it's either been a contamination process with lettuce in a field, so you don't want to go back, buy bag lettuce, okay? Or you read about the hamburger patty plant in Nebraska 10 years ago that had an outbreak of E. coli, shut the plant down, closed the plant because they could not get it clean after that. So it has an effect upon what you choose to eat based upon what you hear that's going on in the media and in the society. How many of you are over 25 years old? Okay, you know what happened December 2000, whatever 25 years ago from now would be, 2000 and Nine? That, no. 25 years ago. 19. <laughs> Who would be with? 93. 93. 1993. Okay, I'm not, I'm not a bat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry about that. You know what happened 25 years ago? Okay, I'll show you. If you were in my business, you would know and if you would recognize it as a very important date, 25 years ago, Jack in the Box. On the West Coast had an outbreak of E. coli, right, in one of their stores. It resulted from hamburgers that were not fully cooked, okay? 25 years ago, what brought it all to light was this young lady, Brianna Kenner. She ate one of those hamburgers. That hamburger was contaminated with E. coli. 0517, it's a particular variety of E. coli. It's found in the intestinal tract of cattle. Got some of it in your intestinal tract too, but the concentrations are not significant that we might find because we don't eat each other in that, that process. The hamburger was contaminated. Didn't get cooked to an endpoint temperature of 155 degrees, which would kill the E. coli. She consumed it, and the fact that she was a young child made her very susceptible to the presence of E. coli in her gastrointestinal tract. What it did is the effect of that bacteria, what it had on her, is it caused her renal shutdown, her kidney shutdown, her liver decreased in function probably about 85%. She had cardiovascular incidences that occurred, all because number of many strokes, poor circulation, loss of muscle tone, all due to the presence of consuming that particular bacteria, okay? They thought she was gonna die, and by all rights, she probably should have died, but she survived. Now, she survived, but she is on permanent dialysis, unless she can get a tra kidney transplant. She has some mental and physical disorders associated with it. She has some neuromuscular disease that goes along with it. They, her parents, sued Jack in the Box, got around $16 million to pay for her care for the rest of her life. Okay, but it all goes back to the fact is that somebody undercooked the hamburger patty. The presence of E. coli in ground meats is not, at that point in time, was not that drastic, drastically unusual. And you still find a little bit of it today. But if you cook it to the right temperature, it's a bacteria, you kill it. You get it above 150 degrees for a slight period of time. You can't cook by color, all right? It doesn't do you any good to, to cook the meat until the juices run clear because the bacteria is present throughout the product. You go buy a roast, and that roast, there's a possibility that roast would have E. coli on the surface. It's a very slight possibility. You take that roast, you put that roast in the oven, and you cook it. You didn't penetrate the interior of it, and as soon as the temperature in the oven gets above 140 
seven, somewhere in there, starts to destroy that bacteria. By the time your oven is at 350 degrees, it kills all the bacteria that's on the outside of that roast. Problem with hamburger is you take all these different pieces, all these different cuts of meat that can be contaminated and you run them through a grinder so that bacteria now is internal in that product. So you have to get that internal temperature to 155 degrees to make sure that you kill that bacteria. 25 years ago, this is what really created a huge push to food safety outside of institutions, outside of the uh, hospitals and the school districts and everything else. It made it more mainstream, if you want to say. Ever since then, you hear about E. coli 057 crops up every so often when there's an outbreak. And it does not have to be in meat. One of the last outbreaks was in cucumbers. Okay, is, and it basically came about because water that was contaminated from fecal material was used to water the cucumbers. The cucumbers were picked and they were sold at, a, at an open market. Okay. People did not rinse them before they consumed them, so they got the E. coli off of the cucumber. People always used to think you could only get it off of meats, but you can't. Okay, and because of the issues that come around with it, that's one of the biggest things that drove the issues we find going on with 20, 25 years ago. They were around a long time before that. Just didn't hit the mainstream until, and the, the problem was it wasn't just E. coli and Jack in the Box. That's where it started. The next cases occurred in Minnesota with a different hamburger chain. Then they were in New York, and then there were some in the South. Just seems to be a period of time. And part of that process was people like slightly undercooked meats. All right? We have a taste for that in, in general. Okay? I'm, and I'm, I'm one of those people. Okay? I, I like my meat red. I don't like it pink. I like it red, you know, when it's, when it's cooked. Now, on a roast or a steak, that's, not, that's all right from that process. You still take a chance, but not a hamburger. After this one, I would never eat a hamburger that's not fully cooked, well, even according to my wife, Bert. Okay? It's the way she eats them. But you deal with those types of things, and that's what this brought out. Okay, so you go from 25 years ago to today, all right? And this was this morning that came up. I follow this website. It's one of them that, that I follow very closely. It's Nutrition Action. They publish Nutrition Action. Action Health Letter, and I like to read it. It's just a good little one to read. But here's their headline. Single bout of food poisoning can have long-lasting consequences. All right? Two pathogens that we look at, salmonella and toxoplasmosis. You know what toxoplasmosis is? You don't hear much about it anymore. It's a little worm, okay? And it lives in the muscle tissue of certain animals. It used to be real prevalent in pork. It used to be real prevalent in, in, in farm-raised hogs because they would feed the hogs, the garbage, right? And the garbage would get contaminated with these little worms, these little parasites. The hog eats it, and then it gets into the muscle structure of the hog. Then when you butcher the hog, you can't see them. But if you didn't cook the meat to 165 plus, you didn't kill it. Well, then the parasite gets in you, basically eats its way through your intestinal tract, gets in your bloodstream, gets in your muscles, and you get weak, okay, in terms of that process. We find almost none of this existed in pork. The fact is they've actually lowered the endpoint temperatures for pork in the last three years because this is somewhat non-existent, okay? especially in commercially grown pork that we see today. But if you buy your pork, if you raise your pork, and you feed it garbage, which that's why you used to keep a hog on the farm, you always had two or three hogs because they would eat the garbage. Okay? If you do that, you want to make sure that your endpoint temperatures are high now. Commercially raised hogs are basically free of this. If you're a wild game hunter, and you, uh, deer is extremely dear. De venison of any type is extremely unlikely to have it, but bear, beaver, raccoon, uh, those types of animals who are what we consider carnivorous animals, meat eaters, have a tendency to have this. So you have to process your meat well, and then you have to cook it well, all right? That's, that's why we don't hear too much about. Salmonella we hear lots about, okay? And the infestations from salmonella, especially dealing with poultry. Poultry is notorious for salmonella, okay, just because of the way it's processed. If you've never watched a, a turkey or a chicken processing event, once in your life you should, okay? It may change how you eat forever, all right, but the way they process those birds and, and how they handle and process those birds, it's done in a, in a sanitary means as possible, but there's still, poultry is just famous for contamination with salmonella. That's a big issue with cross-contamination we'll talk about. So this one was today talks about where you find it. 
And what we see more today is contamination of fresh and raw products than we've seen in the past. And a lot of it has to do with the, the more open organic types of farming methods, the use of animal waste as fertilizer, a greater chance for contamination in those processes is what we see. So there's a lot of that that goes on. There's a chance for this. You hear more about it today, especially since the fact that if you used to want to make a salad, you went out and you bought a head of lettuce and some cucumbers and a few carrots and maybe some radishes and you chopped and cleaned your lettuce and you cleaned your carrots and you did all that yourself. Well, now they bag it. You can go buy bag salad. Problem is, all it takes is one worker or one piece of a contaminated item in a field to contaminate a whole production run of something. And that's why when you see the recalls come out, they're usually regional and big recalls okay, that go on in that process. We had one in southwest Kansas, eastern, southeastern Colorado a few years ago that had to do with cantaloupe. Cantaloupe were watered with, with water that was contaminated with a, with a compound called listeria. Okay, and listeria is one of the, it's a, a normal bacterial product that's found out there, but it also tends to be a very fast growing one that we see in terms of food production. The can surface of the cantaloupe got contaminated with the water. The water got contaminated because of a breach, which was not the producer's fault. It was a small contamination, but they watered the field. Cantaloupes got listeria on them. They harvest them. If you've ever watched lettuce, produce harvest, they harvest in the field these days. They box in the field, they put it on truck, and they ship it. Okay, or they put it in these giant boxes and they ship it right out of the field. Right? The cantaloupe was contaminated with listeria. People went to the store, bought it, handled it, okay, and came down with listeria. Now, listeria is really interesting. If you get salmonella food poisoning from undercooked chicken, you're going to know it in 24 to 48 hours. You're basically going to have the flu, symptoms associated with the flu, okay? The problem with listeria contamination is it can take a week to two weeks before symptoms manifest itself. So it's very hard to trace back as to what the source was. Symptoms are flu-like symptoms, a little bit more progressive than what you might get with salmonella uh, because of different types of bacteria that are involved in the process, but that's what you see. So this one talks about those, and it, and it talks about some of where we see the contamination that goes along with it. Anybody going anywhere for spring break? Where are you going? Houston? Houston. Anybody else? Oregon. Oregon? Okay. The rest of y'all just going to stay here, huh? Kansas City? Well, you're going somewhere, okay, from, from that process where you're going to deal with it. Well, this is a news piece that came out this morning, okay, in relation to, to this. This is another little good piece. It's food safety news, and you can go through it. Here's the thing, everybody's going on spring break. Don't spend your visits in the bathroom, right, with that. All this whole piece does, when it goes through this, is it talks about the possibilities of contamination. It talks about hot foods being served hot, cold foods being served cold. There's all sorts of things that this talks about that if you work with food, they're common sense. But if you don't work with food, they're not always common sense. Food safety isn't really, it's not much of a mystery. It's time, temperature, and cleanliness is what it is. But when you start getting into big areas and things where you encounter, encounter some of these things, you know, the, the food trucks and sanitation issues, safety issues, different destinations, what you see. So I just thought it was interesting. Um, this one I picked up, this, I get a news release from them every morning, and this is the one that came this morning, having to do with spring break, because in some areas, spring break has already started. Okay, so now they're talking about food safety that goes on with spring break. Point is, you don't get away from this, right? It's constant, it's around. Here's another why, little why, piece. Excuse me, yeah. why do you stay out away from the bathroom? No, the idea is watch your intake and the sanitation values involved with your food so you don't spend all the time oh. in the bathroom. Yeah. Okay. And if you're in the bathrooms, what do you want to do? Wash your hands. Wash your hands. Yeah. Before you leave, always wash your hands. How long should you wash them? Until you're done singing happy birthday. You know how long that takes? 20 seconds. Hand washing time is 20 seconds. Okay, and, and, and that means with soap, not just water. Soap, all soap does is it's saponification methods where it cleanses. It doesn't kill anything. All right, it just helps to remove, remove dirt, and in the process of removing dirt, remove the bacteria. Okay, that goes along with, it, with that. 
So this is a, a little piece for Center, for Center for Disease Control. If you want to know what's going on in the world, this tells you right here. Outbreaks by pathogen just for this year. So if you look at E. coli, which we talked about, now not all of these are E. coli 0587, which is right here. And that's the one you want to really be careful of. Notice there's 026, 0212. The lesser forms of, of E. coli basically give you flu-like symptoms. But the biggest portion of those flu-like symptoms are severe intestinal cramping, diarrhea, and a small amount of blood loss from the intestinal tract. 0517, okay, is very painful and causes significant blood loss. You don't know the difference unless you go to the hospital and get tested. But this, this is just this year. Notice cookie dough, beef pizza, Mexican style restaurant chain. And if you want to find out where these go, here's, here's one, spinach. Now this one shows 2006, all right? But it talks about 102 people getting ill, all right? 31 different kidney failure, all associated with this. So if, you, if you're interested in what some of these outbreaks are, here's a place to go look. And if you want to see what else goes on, you go to just to 2018. This one, this, this chicken salad one, has been a, a very interesting one that goes on. And basically, they identified it in February. It was a contaminated chicken salad product sold by a producer to um, grocery stores and restaurants. All right, it was contaminated in the processing, so even though they distributed it, they had no, no idea there was anything wrong with it. So you may open it and eat it, you may think it's fine, but it may not be. You cannot tell that food is contaminated in 95% of the cases. You can't tell it's contaminated by smelling it or by looking at it. Okay, it's not possible. Now, in some cases, you can. If something is contaminated with a product called uh, Clostridium botulinum, okay, it is an anaerobic parasite, which means it can grow in the lack of oxygen. And you, so you find it in canned items. You find it in a lot of home canned items or cans that have been damaged in a store. You ever go to a store and you see what they call a puffer? All right? A puffer is a can that when you set it down is convex, concave. Which convex. Is convex. Okay, on both ends. So when you set it down, it rotates a little bit. Basically means that there's something in that can that should not be there. Okay. If you go and you purchase a jar, um, was it oh, a few weeks ago? I went to Dylan's and I bought spaghetti sauce in a draw, jar. Cheap when I went home to make spaghetti instead of making the scratch. Took it out of the jar. Um, I got home and they have a little pressure ring in the center of the jar. That pressure ring should be concave. You should be able to press on it, not hear anything. I pressed on it and I got hit the pop, which basically means the seal had been broken. So I returned the jar without ever taking the lid off. That's an indication that that is there. So convex or concave cans, leakers, cans that have small pinhole leaks in them, and you see small amounts of liquids on them, don't buy it. Or pick them up and return them. Take them up to the front counter and give them back. And it may not be that can that's leaking, but one can on the shelf is leaking. The thing is, you don't know. But those are contaminated products. If you have products that are contaminated and you want to dispose of them, go see your local county extension agent. They'll take care of them. Basically what they do them is they take them out and then they either uh, burn them or they bury them uh, in the landfill. So when the contamination, when the product does break, or contamination is it's absorbed by the soil, soil draws the majority of the moisture away from it and the product dies. Okay, or you can bury it in sugar. If you bury it in sugar, it just sucks all the moisture away from it and won't live. But that's expensive way to do that. So here you can go back in if you know if you really if you have an interest, if you like beef and you have an interest in this, you can see what's going on in, in the nation. So we, we look at the different products, and the different recalls, and the information that comes out. So 25 years ago, all of this became mainstream information to the public simply because somebody didn't cook a hamburger well enough. All right? And you still see that going on today. You go to a restaurant today, what's it tell you on the menu? Outside of food and prices. Calories. Calories, outside of calories. Talking about food safety, what's it tell you? Consuming undercooked meat. <laughs> okay, well, undercooked meat products uh, and or eggs. Yeah. Raw, undercooked meat products and eggs. Okay, if you choose to cho choose to consume them in that manner, you stand a risk. That's what they have to do. They have to put that on, on that menu. Because if you go in and you order two eggs, sunny side up and running, 
your eggs are not fully cooked. They have not reached the temperature to destroy the bacteria. Okay? But one thing about eggs is most eggs are not, most eggs that concern us salmonella, it's not the inside of the egg. It's on the outside of the egg. All right? So the point is in cracking the egg, you want to try to keep it as a clean a process as possible. In, in that. And if you cook it, and you cook it to an endpoint temperature that's adequate, you'll destroy the bacteria that's there and what creates the problem. So different things. You'll see these in the news in the news media. Hayes Daily News covers them every once in a while. Get up and listen to the morning, morning news when they talk about the recalls that are going on, or they talk about the outbreaks, and, and they do because based upon law now, all the coding that goes on a food product tells you where it was produced, how it was canned, uh, who the main purveyor was, who the secondary purveyor was. So they can go back and they can run those codes and they can tell you that there are 35 jars of contaminated peanut butter in Scott City, Kansas at such and such little grocery store. I used to work for a, a company, it was called Product Recall. And that was a, a job I did, I just drove around. They would send me notices on food products for recalls. And I would go, I went to a small grocery store and bought 40 boxes of cereal one day. Okay, all because there were metal shavings in the cereal. But not necessarily in those 40 boxes, but they were in that batch. I, I went to another place and, and I bought 80 pounds of processed chicken, okay, because that particular lot was contaminated. They found some contaminated product in them. I took it home and I said, okay, what do I do with it? Well, I have 80 pounds of processed chicken. I put it in a big pot, I cooked it on the stove, I dumped it in the trash, and it went to the landfill. That was the disposal process that was followed. Made pretty good money doing that. Traveled a lot all over Kansas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska. But it's amazing how they get the product back and they can track it. Food safety issues that you see with that. So let's do a little bit of this. Right? Why does it become important to us? Right? If you got sick last year related to a foodborne component, you were one of 76 million people in the United States. Okay? That's about it. 75 million, they say, has been the average for the last five to seven years. Okay, in, in that number. So it up, went up a little bit last year in terms of, of that process. What you can see, 325,000 are serious enough that they will go to the hospital or be taken to the hospital. That tells you that the rest of the people who encountered a foodborne illness weren't sick enough to go to the hospital. All right? So, probably flu like. You ever think about this, that after Thanksgiving vacation, everybody in the family comes down with the flu? Does it ever make you wonder? Did everybody in the family come down with the flu or did the food sit out too long on the counter? Somebody undercooked something. Someone had a cold and sneezed over one dish when nobody could see them, all right? So then they just set it out on the counter so you couldn't do it, okay? Or they were playing with the dog and they went from playing with the dog to putting the uh, fresh sliced vegetables on a tray with the dip. So whatever the dog had was contaminated to the vegetables, which now becomes spread to everybody else. You ever think, you'll never look at a holiday again the same way, especially if you're sick, I guarantee you, of, of that in, in that process and what you see. 5,000 people a year die, okay? Most of the time we don't think, you now food may make us sick, but it's not gonna kill us. It will, okay? And especially if you're in a category that's, that's at risk for, for that process, okay? This, uh, this presentation, in part, comes out of a, a ConAgra grant that the American Dietetics Association got, which was given to the American Nutrition Association, of which I'm a member, and so I'm using pieces of that in, in this and that, that goes along with it. So when you think about this, they did a survey. The American Dietetics Association did this survey about three years ago, and they simply asked people, 82%, well over three-fourths of the people they asked, said food safety is important to them. I don't want to get sick. All right, that, that was the answer from the food. And how it's done and how it's handled. 97% person preparing food in the home plays the biggest role. On the home side, yes. But now you think about when you go somewhere to eat. Okay, whether you go to a fast food establishment or you go to a restaurant, there are more people involved that you cannot control. Okay, and the aspects that go along with that. You think about it that when you watch people prepare foods now that they're gonna serve you and they're wearing plastic gloves. Yet you see somebody else preparing food and they're not wearing plastic gloves. The food code says you only have to wear plastic gloves 
if you are handling a food product that's going to be directly consumed. So example, Subway. You, everybody sooner or later in their life goes to Subway. Okay, when they make a Subway sandwich, they wear gloves because all the food they're handling is going to be eaten by directly by a consumer. If you go to a someplace like uh, or I say Applebee's or someplace like that, where they're preparing hot food and plating it and serving it, kitchen staff doesn't wear the gloves for the hot food, but they would for the cold food, okay, because of the way it's handled and served. The server doesn't have to wear the gloves because they're not preparing the food. But you have to work with people to make them understand the gloves are not there to protect you. The gloves are there to protect the people you're going to serve the food to. So if you're wearing gloves while you're preparing something and then you go empty the trash with the same gloves on, when you come back, you should change your, change your gloves. gloves. Yes, same concept at home, only a little different. If you're preparing food at home and you empty the trash or you put something in the trash and you tie the bag off and you're gonna go do it later, you should wash your hands in between doing those things. Very simple little things that fit in that process. And sometimes we just forget about them and what we see goes along. This is, and you'll notice, back on this slide, this is a little terminology thing uh, that, that we run into, it's foodborne illness. That's the correct term. You are not poisoned by food. Food makes you ill. Okay, food poisoning is just an old attitude or term that's been around for a long time. But you're not poisoned by the food itself. You're made ill through contact or contamination of the food product. So we can look at it in two different ways. One, we've got an infection that goes along here. So in a foodborne infection, food's been contaminated with microbes or pathogens. Now, they could be, it could be contaminated by setting it on the table and picks up something off the table. It could be contaminated by me if I'm sick or what I handle. It could be contaminated by a purveyor or a mid-person in between this, or the simple fact is that I was not paying attention and I chopped up raw chicken on my cutting board and somebody came behind me and laid the celery down and sliced the celery and put it on the food tray. Okay, that's cross-contamination. The chicken contaminates the cutting board, okay, then the cutting board contaminates the raw food product. Okay, so cross-contamination. I Somebody told me, we have a group of us that get together and fix dinner for our wives on Valentine's. And last year we did a whole bunch of chicken and poultry things. And everybody kept telling me I was crazy because I kept, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands, you know. Okay, use that cutting board for that case. Take that out of there. Pretty soon somebody just goes, chill out, Neil. We're not gonna get sick. And I said, I know we're not gonna get sick because you're not doing those things, okay, from those processes. Infection. Symptoms will vary. These are generally milder. This is gonna be your intestinal cramping, a little bit of diarrhea, 24 hours to 48 hours. Okay, this is your bug. So it's hard to tell whether you have a real severe cold sometimes or the flu or a foodborne illness. That's why so much of it goes unreported. It's because of the symptoms and the way we recognize the symptoms. And we don't always think it's food. Sometimes we might, but we don't always think it's food in that process than what we see. The foodborne intoxication then is what we look at as being the more severe parts that goes along with this. In essence, there's a toxin. The one that most people are familiar with, and these days they're not familiar with it in terms of food, is botulism. Clostridium botulinum. Anybody have botulism injections? Okay. It's basically the same type no. of neurotoxin that you use. Nope? No. Okay. Botulism does the same thing. If you were to go get an injection, Okay, the purpose is the same thing as what Clostridium botulism does to you, but from the gastric side. And that is, it's a neurotoxin. It actually destroys or dramatically reduces the effect of transmission and response with nerves. If you consume something that has botulism, dietary form of botulism, you get lightheaded, you get dizzy, and then one of the first responses that you have is you have difficulty breathing. And basically what happens is it causes the neuroelectric response from the brain to your lungs, that involuntary impulse that tells you your lungs are supposed to work to make you breathe, and they stop, so you'll suffocate. Okay. It's very dramatic, and, and, but we don't see a lot of it. We see it every so often. This is something you're likely to find in home can products that have not reached the correct temperature. Okay. Um, sometimes you'll find it in oh, fresh products, but it's pretty unusual. 
Most of the time this shows up as a problem in canned products and primarily home canned products. So caution when you go to the farmer's market, whatever you get, make sure you cook well. Okay, or if you get home canned pickles, okay, and you really like home canned pickles, when you first pop that, when you first pop that lid or you first crack that seam, if you don't hear that release in that air being pulled into that product, your vacuum was not properly formed, I wouldn't eat them. I just dispose of them from, from that process. Remember, you can't tell by looking, tasting, or smelling. The, the old saying that, that we used for years in food service was, when in doubt, throw it out. If there's a question about it, throw it out. It's not worth the money that it costs you if you're wrong. Okay, now food cost is expensive, and if, and if you're looking at two T-bone steaks that you just paid $18 a piece for, and you're trying to think to yourself, okay, they were on the counter when I got home, so uh, did my wife set them out at noon, or did I put them out last night and forget about them? Okay, you're gonna weigh that, but it's always better to go on the side of, of caution and what we see. Here's some of the more common ones and where you find them. Uh, in terms of what we see, salmonella versus Campylobacteria. Salmonella is a lot more prevalent. Okay, poultry products more more so than anything. Okay, with with that raw produce, this gets easily contaminated. You ever think about it? You buy cucumbers, you buy apples, you buy oranges. Okay, pardon me. You buy bananas. You ever rinse the bananas off before you eat them? Why not? If they're contaminated and you're peeling them down you're getting contamination on your hands, which is easily spread, especially if you break it apart. Now, if you peel your banana down and you only eat it holding on to the peeling, you're okay. But you ever think about where an apple's been? Okay, how it got there? Sometimes the most, the most interesting place in the world is a supermarket, okay? Go, get your cart, put a few items in your cart, and then just walk around and watch people. Okay, follow people around the store, see what they bought see what they touch. When you go into the produce department, maybe you do this. Do you always pick up the first apple you see and put it in your bag? Or do you pick up the first apple you see and you turn it around and you look for the right color, you look to see how the stem's on it, and you're gonna pick up that cantaloupe, you pick up those oranges to feel how firm they are, or when you go pick up that head of lettuce. Now lettuce most of the time these days is already wrapped in plastic, so that's pretty good. But you think about how often you touch things. How many people go through that grocery store every day? How many people touch the same thing you do before you buy them? Every time somebody touches it, it gets the possibility of contamination. So, rinse your fresh fruits and vegetables before you consume them. Rinsing them does not guarantee, but a nice rinse, cold running water washes away surface contamination components. Soap or not? Um, I don't recommend soap. Soap is a cleansing agent and, and it doesn't it, the, the studies show that washing them with soap is not much better than just rinsing them under cold water. Same is true with grapes, you know, plums, anything like that. Just a, a good rinse of running water works pretty well for that. And studies also tell us that these uh, safety or these vegetable washes, I don't know if you've ever seen them, that you can buy these ingredients and they, say, they don't do much better than just plain water. Okay, it's just the act of washing the product that, that, you, that gets you that benefit so when you go through that. But the, the salmonella, most, you're best off if you simply assume poultry is contaminated, wherever it came from. So whatever you do with poultry, you should set all of those appliances aside, okay, and then start over with something else. But make sure you clean your countertop, make sure you wash your hands, don't use the same knife, change your cutting board over for those types of products. So you don't get in that cross-contamination contaminating work surfaces and going through that. So we see quite a bit of that. A lot of eggs are contaminated, but the simple fact is the shells are contaminated. It's on the surface. And so if you crack the egg open and you cook your eggs so that they're done well enough, the contamination is not an issue. Okay. Or hard boiled eggs. You don't worry about it then because the temperature is high enough to deal with the shells and what we see. Unpasteurized dairy products. Uh, probably in just this year, there's been four um, reported cases of people selling raw milk. Now you can sell raw milk, all right? It's a controlled agency. You know, everybody know what I mean, raw milk? Okay, you're right? All right, you can buy, you can sell and you can buy raw milk, but as a consumer, you assume the risk, okay? 
but there's been four cases this year, rather large cases, where milk's been contaminated with campylobacteria, okay, and made people sick, and so then it kind of gets recalled in, into that process and what we see. And the same thing is true with different types of cheeses, that if you go buy cheeses from somebody who makes their own cheese, you assume the risk is the consumer, right, and that's, that's a pretty big deal through that. Uh, Listeria, I mentioned this one before. We don't think of lunch, we think of lunch meat's been pretty safe to eat because they got so many additives and processed so much and all this and they can be contaminated relatively easily with listeria. And the problem again, remember with listeria, it's flu-like symptoms, but it may take 10 days to two weeks before they show up. So then it's really hard to go back and trace them to listeria. And it does make you quite a bit sicker than what some of the other things. And then E. coli, uh, you know, that, that you find. The problem with E. coli is the way it spreads. It doesn't have to be fecal material that spreads it. It's handling the fecal material. It's water contaminated with fecal material. It's a product in, in the distribution area that's contaminated with fecal material. And all food product has to do is come in contact with it. Now, if you follow safe handling procedures and safe preparation, times and temperatures, most of the time you deal with it. It's present, but you deal with it in terms of that, that process. So a lot of it's just following the procedures in terms of what we see. Infections and symptoms, well, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea, the flu. That, that tends to be what we see with the, the main aspects of, of symptoms that go along with this. Okay? Sometimes it lasts longer. Who's at risk? This is what really brought out the, the E. coli stuff 25 years ago was the age of the girl and her physical condition. If you're sick, you're at more of a risk. If you're an elderly person, your defensive systems are not as high as they used to be. Pregnant women are at risk, which is always kind of unusual because pregnant women are generally healthier in all other aspects. Okay, but they have, if you wanted to say it, you could say a little bit more active intestinal tract. Digestive absorptive rates go up and increase for the need for nutrients. So you see some of that. If you work with an ind older individual, you know you have to be specifically careful when you do some of those. If you have a, a relative in long-term care or a nursing home or grandparents that are around, because their age makes them susceptible, or very young children are very susceptible. People whose immune system is not as strong as it should be, they're more susceptible than other people. So you can have a mild to a severe case, depending upon your own health in, in terms of, of what we see. Things that you then can do in this process, right? Is your refrigerator at the right temperature? Yes or no? How many of you know? How do you know? I have a thermometer thing. You have a thermometer in your refrigerator that says it's below 40 degrees. Is your freezer at the right temperature? Um, I don't know for sure. It should be at zero or below. Danger zone for bacterial growth, 40 degrees to 140. Bacteria grows best between those, those two levels. Anything over 140, okay, heat starts to kill. Now, problem is it doesn't kill, it kills different bacteria at different rates. That's why most of the time they talk about safe endpoint temperatures starting at 150 degrees to get you above that 140, okay, in terms of what we see. So you look at those poor personal hygiene, 20 seconds, sing yourself happy birthday every time you wash your hands, and it seems like an eternity. You ever notice that? When you're timing something, 20 seconds seems like an eternity while you're standing there and rubbing your hands, you know, and, and going through that whole process. And at least it seems like an eternity to me from that process. Uh, cross contaminant we talked about, contaminated foods, undercooking we talked about. How many of you own a stick thermometer? To, do you use your stick thermometer? Okay, very good. If you don't own one, go buy one. They're only a couple of bucks, okay, but they're great. And when you buy one, make sure that it has the, if it's the regular dial thermometer, make sure that it has a nut on the back of it so you can check its temperature. Or if it's digital, check its temperature. And you know how to check its temperature, see if it's right. Take a glass, put ice in it, fill it up with water, drop your thermometer in there. It should read what? 32 degrees, temperature of ice water. Okay. So that's, that's what you find in that process. So you can adjust that. 32, 36 degrees is if you're in there, you're pretty good. Some of those digital ones you cannot adjust. I have a really nice thermometer I use on my grill, and meat always comes out to the temperature that I like it, and the color that I like it, which is red, okay? My wife cannot stand it, all right? So I keep saying, 
endpoint temperature is right. Endpoint temperature is right. So she tested that thermometer against the others. Mine's 10 degrees off on the low side. Okay. So we now have a new one that is tested and it's right. So meat now comes out the way my wife likes it. Okay, not the way I like it. So how it should be cooked. Or how my dad used to order, if you go someplace and you sit down with him and he'd order a steak and they'd say, how would you like that cooked? Creamy. And if they brought it to him and it wasn't dry and cream, I mean cremated, he'd send it back. I never could figure out how he'd eat that stuff. Okay. Two hour rule. What's two hour rule? It has to go in the refrigerator after two hours. Okay. Two hours is the longest time it should set out on the counter, unprotected. If it's over two hours, throw it away. Now, some foods will last, and they, some foods will last longer than that, but you're still safe at, at two hours. If you're outside and it's warm, set that as an hour. Got that back, okay? Now, it doesn't make a difference if it's cold outside, it's still two hours. And because it's air contamination and everything else that goes along. They used to say mayonnaise salads, potato salads, mayonnaise salads that, that are made with real mayonnaise shouldn't be left on the counter any more than an hour. These days, most mayonnaise, especially commercial mayonnaise, is made with pasteurized processed eggs. So they've already been, so that eliminates that salmonella issue. But if you make your own, it's a little bit more limited. Now, most people don't mess around with their own mayonnaise anymore, but it's pretty good if you make your own and you like your own style. So you just have to handle it a little bit different from that than what we see. Serving foods, surface is clean, okay? We still no different. You go somewhere else, when you go to a restaurant, I always like to go to a restaurant, and before I sit down, I like to watch how they serve food and how they clean tables. And it always makes me nervous if the person cleaning the tables is the same person that comes and takes my order and brings me my food. Okay, because I want to know, are they washing their hands in between taking dirty dishes back and bringing food out? Okay, now I'm not so rigid that I would follow them around and watch them. Okay, but it always makes me wonder you know, in, in terms of that process as to how that goes. How they handle glasses. It really drives me nuts when somebody brings me a water glass and their fingers are in it. Okay, you know, in terms of that process. Or if they're laying silverware out, they, you request some silverware, put a napkin on the table and they hand, they touch the silverware on the spoon end or the tine end on the fork or the cutting surface on the knife. Okay, that's a contamination process that goes on and you, you watch those things. You, my wife and I are no fun to go, we think we're fun to go eat with, nobody else does. Because we both have been in, in commercial food service, and so we walk in and the first thing you do is you look at the carpet. Okay, and they put carpet down in dark colors because it hides stains. That's how you, so you look for the stains on the carpet. Then when you sit down, you look at the napkins, and the first thing you do is you unroll your silverware. If it's got water spots on it, it means somebody needs to go back and check the temperatures on the disc machine, the sanitizing agent, and the drying agent to make sure that the machine is still putting them out. If the glasses come out and they're water spotted, you, know, you don't want that. If the glass has got a crack in it, doesn't mean it's where the crack is. We always flag the waitress or waiter down and say, you'd like a new glass. Crack contains contaminations. Bring me food on a chipped plate and I'll send it back. Because I don't know whether the plate was chipped before you serve it to me or after it was served to me from, from those processes. You, you look at your server, you know, when you, are their fingernails clean? When they bring your, when they come and they wait on you, are their hands clean? Do they have fingernail polish on? Food service people should never wear fingernail polish. You know why? It's enamel. It's actually harder than the nail. So if the fingernail polish breaks off and you bite into the fingernail polish, it's harder, it's worse than biting into your fingernail. Okay, so they should never wear fingernail polish. Okay, a lot of places don't do too much with that anymore. But just different things that you look at for contamination in what you see. If you're at home, common sense, clean things. Don't use the same rag to wipe up the chicken uh, left over or the, the liquid out of the chicken bag as, as you're using to wipe the counter off or you're going to do the next piece of work. It's cross-contamination. Food safety is no mystery. It's really common sense okay, when you put it together. And that's the, the thing you run into with the contamination. You know, wash your hands, 20 seconds, happy birthday, or just think of eternity while you're washing your hands. You know that you're going to sing that song forever and, and what you can see. Uh, different times, it's just information on, on, on that. You know, be cautious, be cognizant of what you do, you know, 
nothing wrong with scratching your hair until you go handle somebody else's food product. Touching your face, okay, picking up and moving things. We don't always think about those, but those are way contamination occurs. You know, there's way contamination occurs. And, and so what you do is just common sense things and try, and try to do this. Kitchen surface safety, uh, keep it clean. I love Clorox and water. Bleach and water does wonders. Uh, you know, for things. The only problem is you have to be careful not to drip it on your clothes. Uh, I have a number of pairs of jeans that have little white spots on them because I drip Clorox water when I clean things. I also have a piece of carpet in the house that's got white spots on it because uh, I was cleaning things in the kitchen and went to check on something and when I came back I noticed there were these little white spots, water spots on the carpet and I never thought anything about them until the next morning. My wife says, what you do to the carpet? I didn't do anything to the carpet. She says, look at all those little spots you cleaned yesterday, didn't you? See, she knew. And they're still there. 15 years they've been there. We're never going to take them out and move them because she can always point to those. And I did something wrong. That's right. <laughs> We've been married 40 years, so I'm pretty good at that. Two second rule means? What's two second rule? You drop it off the floor. You drop it on the floor, pick up and eat it. Can you? Yes, you can. Should you? <laughs> no, you shouldn't. See, there's the difference. You can drop it on the floor and pick it up and eat it. You can, but should you? No. Science studies from most, most food science studies tell us that the minute it contacts the floor, it's pretty much as contaminated as it been, is if it's going to sit there for five or ten seconds. Okay. Bacterial contamination spreads like that. That's the fact. So the two-second rule really doesn't apply. Now, you can pick it up and rinse it off, depending upon what it is, uh, and you know, most people would do that. I would never rinse off cooked food. Okay. You, know, you just kind of, that's what dogs and cats are for. You just feed them cooked food okay, from that process. But uh, except mine, you doesn't eat it. So she likes her regular food. So, two second rule, huh, right? even though it's out there. That's just an old wife's tale, which many things are. I'm going to shut up. Anybody got any questions? Anything? I'm amazed my children lived. Yeah. <laughs> All those things. I grew up in a house with a dietitian. My mother was a dietitian, and that's what—that's where I learned to cook and prepare foods in the kitchen and clean and all of those things. That when when you cook, your dirty dishes should be done before you eat. So when you come back, the only dishes you have left to do were those that food was prepared in or that you used to eat. That's the way I was raised in that process, and it was just this constant move in a circle to, to go through everything. If you made cookies, while your cookies were in the oven, you were cleaning your paint, you were cleaning your mixing bowl, your ingredients, and all those different things. And you had the water, the dish water, you come to our house and you put your hands in the dish water, you better be ready. Okay? It's hot. Okay. It's just the way the way I grew up. Terry was Terry was that way working in, in food service. We sort of have a unique arrangement in the kitchen. When she's there I'm not. When I'm there she's not. And it works really well, okay. you know, from, from that with husband and wife. Anything else? Questions? Yes. Um, go ahead. Do you have any rules for sprouting? My mother got me a sprouter for my birthday. Watch very carefully what you plant. If you're going to raise your own sprouts to start with, and you're going to raise them in soil, or are you oh, talking God, about one where you just put it in on a wet towel? And yeah, like a plastic cup. Okay. Uh, use them as soon as they are ready. Don't hold them for long periods of time. Uh, you're best if you do that. Make sure even though, even though you're the one who's grown them that you wash them well before you use them. Does meat have different recommended cooking temperatures because of the different... Based on degrees of doneness. Okay. That's what it's based on. Okay. Uh, um, the temperature chart has changed over the years. It used to be if you wanted something rare, okay, they considered 140 as the low cutoff on the end, and then like 140 to 150 was rare, 150 to 160 was, was medium, and above 160 was well done. Okay, and there are varying degrees in that. What you will find now, commercially now, the recommendation is cook your meats to 155. Uh, some, some things you'll see 150. Most of the time you hear 155. Pol pork products should be 165. Poultry products should be a, um, a minimum probably of 180. Uh, sometimes you'll see poultry products listed at 165. Okay, they will vary a little bit based on what the products are, are today. 
But I would suggest that the best thing to do, go to the, just go online for Kansas State University Research and Extension, print yourself off a temperature chart, and it tells you what they are, but then it means you have to use your thermometer. Yeah. Most, most poultry products, you, they're probably the biggest thing to make sure that you get done. They always used to say that with poultry, you just cook it until the juices run clean. That doesn't hold true. Okay, the juices may run clean, but the temperature may not be high enough to do that. Uh, chicken. A lot of people, uh, well, okay. Most people buy frozen processed or fresh processed chicken today, which means you get, you go buy it at the store and you get these great big chicken breasts and some of these different things. Uh, not very many people buy farm fresh birds these days because you have to cut them up yourself. But you can get poultry meat to the right temperature, yet when you peel it away from the bone, it will be, still be red. Now, it will not be pink. It will be a dark red. And that's an indication of blood loss from the bone during cooking, and then it cooks alongside the meat. So sometimes it's even black next to the bone. There's nothing wrong with it, so long as your temperature was high enough. And you find that more with really young fryers and really old birds. Okay, but, but you do some of that. The, uh, the turkey products, they have the pop-up thermometers in them. They always tell you that. Uh, those are really cool. They give you an idea when it's done. Still stick your own thermometer in. Always make sure that you stick it in the largest piece of meat away from the bone because the bone heats up faster and retains heat longer so it creates an artificial elevation in temperature. <coughs> yes, ma'am. How does really like salt and hot dish water actually help? Yes. Okay. You know, when you when you wash at home, it's the combination of the, the soap and the hot water and the cleansing agent. So it's it's washing it with the soapy hot water to get everything off that really holds and traps the bacteria, and then it's the rinsing that fo the follow-up step that goes along with it. If you do commercial you'll find that most commercial dish machines are they're either a single bay three cycle machine or they they're a large three bay machine and what you have is you have a pre rinse and wash in the first bay probably around it's, it's been a while I don't remember the temperatures exactly but they're going to be around 160 degrees then you're going to have your wash temperature which is going to be somewhere around 180 degrees and then you're going to have your final rinse temperature, which is going to be even hotter than that, but will contain a sanitizing agent too. So it's just different process going through. It's been a while since I've done those temperatures. Don't quote me on those. I, I may be low on some of those. Okay. Sure. You said water spots are bad. Yeah. Is that on commercial? I didn't say water right? spots are bad. Okay. Water spots just indicate what? Dishwashing equipment might not be working properly. Right. So is that also true of home dishwashers or just commercial dishwashers? No, it's home dishwashers too. And what you should check, two things you should check. You should check the temperature of your dish, dishwasher. And that takes a special thermometer that you can buy. And it's you just buy it and you put it in your dishwasher during the cycle. And it has two, what do you call those little things? Whatever, temperature gauges on it. And it has a red line gauge, so as the temperature comes up, when it reaches a high point, the other one goes down, but that other one remains there. So it tells you how hot your water got, right, in that, that process. And then the other thing to check is your rinse agent, whether you use uh, jet dry or air dry or whatever those products are. Those are the two main things to check. And then, do you have soft water or hard water? If you have hard water, your dishes are more likely to spot because there's more chemical, there's more uh, limestone basically lime in the water. When it goes to um, dry, it tends to leave a little spots. That's what your rinse agent or your jet dry is for. It helps to wash that away. So three things. The first thing I'd do is simply go check my little well and make sure I have enough rinse agent. I never use rinse agent. No. Okay. Uh, if you heat dry, your dishwasher has a heat dry setting, you're less likely to get water spots. You have soft water. Well, you have hard water and haze out unless you have a water softener. Yeah. So, but that's, I mean, that's what you see. All that, all those are, those water spots are just mineral spots. It's, it's not a, really a concern about cleanliness unless there's an oil or a film still on your glass. Then your temperature is definitely not getting hot enough. So, 
in, in washing, is, uh, is, it, is there a difference in uh, drying with a paper towel as opposed to the hand blower dryer? Probably the best thing to do really is let them air dry. Uh, hand blower dryer will work, but usually if you let them air dry, you're not bringing more air in, more contamination in. Paper towel is probably better than cloth towel. Right. Okay. How about using sponges? No. No. I grew up using a sponge. You no. Know? And then you clean the sponge by pushing it in, the, putting it in the dishwasher. That helps. It's not the greatest thing in the world. Okay. You know, in, in terms of that process. Except there are some new sponges out. They're actually designed to be used in that manner. You use them to wash your dishes with and then they're actually designed to go in the dishwasher. They can stand the higher heat without breaking down and then you can just reuse them. Are there any local restaurants you do not eat at anymore? <laughs> no. I don't go, I don't go in the back of the house. You learn that very quickly if you work in food service. Um, you just, you, if you like to eat at a place, you eat at a place and you don't really go in the back of the house unless you know the people involved. So you, you know, differences in seeing how it's prepared. And I don't, not saying that there's anything wrong with it. You just tend, you kind of tend to avoid that, that process. No, I, I, you know, most places around here, I think are pretty good to eat. Every so often the sanitation report comes out when the sanitation report comes out, it shows up in the paper, I read that and then decide how soon I'm going to go back to some place and eat. I was just going to say, don't the food inspections take care of that pretty much? They come in unannounced? Well, the food inspection comes in and they can cite you for certain things. Depending upon what they cite you for, you have different lengths of time in order to correct them. Okay. And some are, some are serious enough where they close you. You know, and then you have so many days to fix it. Others are ongoing things that, yeah, maybe they came in and they found something setting out that shouldn't have been setting out, but normally it's not, so you either put it away or dispose of it, but they'll write you, they can write you up for it. Where can you find those without? Uh, they used to publish them in the Hayes Daily every so often. I'm not sure how often they're done in Hayes. Uh, call the fire department. They're the ones that used to be responsible for it. I don't know if they still are. Uh, but they did, the, they were responsible for it, but what they had is they had someone who did a fire inspection and someone who did a food safety at the same time. And so I don't know if, if they, that's been years ago though, I don't know. Uh, KDHE used to take care of it too. And so there's been some differences. I would probably start with KDHE, Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Find out who the surveyor is in the area and 